Hey guys, and welcome back to the Pennies to Pounds podcast with your host Kia. And this is a podcast where we aim to dispel your myths, simplify difficult financial jargon and rectify your own personal problems. Happy Monday, everyone. I'm so happy to be back. I know I've been gone for a little minute, but it was my birthday. So I am officially a year older. And as I say, a year wiser. And with that wisdom comes a gem filled episode. We're going to be talking about everything that you need to know. If you're someone who is on a variable income, like you're a freelancer, don't worry, I've got you covered on this episode. If you haven't listened to the last episode, make sure you go and check it out. It's all about life insurance and getting yourself set up because it's very, very important. And it's not just for when you turn old. So make sure you go back and have listened to that one first and then come back to this one. But let's get straight into today's episode with my amazing guest. Guest, who are you? Hi, hello everybody. Uh, I'm Susie and I am a finance fairy godmother for small uh, charities in the performing arts and also for creative creative freelancers. Amazing. I am super duper happy to have you here. First and foremost, let's talk about your journey. So you have experience in the freelance lifestyle. Talk us through your career path and what that's looked like so far. Sure. Well, actually, funnily enough, my first job was as a dancer. Oh, wow. It happened like a little bit like in the movies. So um, I always danced since I was little. Um, and then when I was in the advanced class, um, the choreographer of the company that was connected to my dance school, he called me and he said, Susie, one of the dancers is ill. She's going to be fine. But do you want to learn her part and do Whoa. the show in a couple of weeks time? Whoa. And I said, of course, I want to be the protagonist of this movie. <laughs> Let me in. Um, and so that was my first little thing that I did for three years. Um, but then after a while, I just I just felt like it wasn't my it wasn't the thing for me. I think that if you see a dance show, you look at the dancers and you say they are born to do exactly that. And I didn't feel like I was born to do exactly that. I was an OK dancer, but I wasn't at the top. Um, and so I uh, decided to merge uh, my interest in theater and the performing arts with my background in business. Uh, I did a master's degree, then I did an internship in a theater in New York, then I moved here in London, um, and I carved my way in, in the accounting um, world, and specifically in charity and performing arts accounting. Amazing. What a journey that yeah, you've had. I <laughs> exactly. That's such... That's why I love asking people about their journeys because it's never that plain sailing. Never like, linear, isn't you know, it? I knew I was going to do this from young. Some people do, but a lot of people, it's, it's this back and forth. It's doing that and changing to here. That's and right. Great That's how hear. we want it. That's how we want it. it. It does make you an all-rounded person. I love it. I love indeed, it. Indeed, indeed. And um, we spoke before we recorded and you mentioned that you love accounting. Yes, I really, really do. And actually, I found out that it's not uncommon for dancers specifically to then get a career either in maths or in accounting. Interesting. Because it has to do with, well, you're always looking for perfection. You know, it, when you're a dancer, you're surrounded by, by mirrors because every single part of you needs to be perfect. And also it has to do with like balance and rigor and discipline and all of that and accounting. I mean, I'm making it sound like it's quite stale, but actually <laughs> I, I love accounting for how actually vibrant and interesting it is. But um, yeah, it's not uncommon for dancers to find themselves in, in, in an accounting world after they retire. That is really interesting to know. Whoa, yeah. I'm going to look at some of my dancer friends and say, I know where you're going to end up. I can already see them. Send them over to me. Send I'm going to indoctrinate them in the, in the finance world. <laughs> now we know. Now we know their end career path. We know it. Yeah. <laughs> but let's get straight into it then. So I have been working, doing what I do now for the past probably about three and a half years full time. So I know what it means to have income where some months things are great yeah and in other months you're like oh my gosh maybe it's noodles for dinner <laughs> and lunch and breakfast because i don't know when the next paycheck's coming in so i want to ask you then how does someone who is working freelance who wants to work for themselves or maybe just doesn't have stable income mm -hmm. how do they navigate the ups and downs of that var variable income yeah uh, fantastic question. So I would say that the, there's one very important figure that you should know about your finances, and that is what is your minimum monthly spend? So if you took out all the fluff, if you took out all the non-essentials that you spend every month, what is the minimum amount that you are able to spend without being kicked out of your house and without starving? So that would be the sum of your rent, your bills, um, your phone bills, um, and your minimum groceries. 
And that is a very important figure because it tells you what's the minimum amount of income that you should have in order for you to be okay at the end of the month. And once you have that income, what I always suggest is to multiply, multiply that by at least three, and that's gonna be your starting emergency fund. So if you are a freelancer who is, um, who, you know, as many do have variable income, my first suggestion is figure out what that figure is and then start saving towards an emergency fund so that in leaner months, you have a little bit of, of a cushion um, saving you from ramen noodles. Um, <laughs> I mean, they're, they're really hitting. They are nice. I, well, I got back into them, I won't lie. I, they are really nice. They are nice, but you know what I meant. Um, and then of course, um, you want also to prevent very, very high oscillations of income month to month. And that can come in many different ways. Um, you can prevent this. So one is diversifying your income. So finding more than one way to, to earn an income, divers diversifying your offer. Um, and also, um, there's absolutely nothing wrong with sticking to a nine to five. Mm -hmm. This is something that, th so I work a lot with um, creative freelancers and artists, most of all. A lot of them are from theater, but not necessarily some illustrators and designers. And all of them have this narrative that if you, you're only su successful if you're able to leave your 95. Until then, then you're not making it, quote unquote. Um, and I completely push back. If it makes sense to you, if, if you get to a place where you want to and it makes sense financially for you to leave your 95 and focus 100% on your um, freelance job, fantastic, go for it, amazing. It doesn't need to look like, way, like that way. It doesn't need to look like that way. Um, so for example, I still have a nine to five. I do it two, uh, two days per year. And because I work in an accounting firm, it makes sense to me to continue to work there. And all the clients that I manage in my employed job are, are all um, charities or are purpose led. So they're perfectly aligned with the way that I want to spend my time. Um, and I learn from that job too. So um, nothing wrong if you decide to pick up a, sh a shift in your local cafe or hold on to a nine to five just to keep a little bit of that financial stability month to month. I think that's a great point that you make because like you said, a lot of people believe if I haven't been able to completely swap out my full-time income with my side hustle effectively, yeah. that you're not doing well. But I think if anything, the smarter way is to carry on that job, to ha have it supplement you know, what you're trying to build. Yeah to give you some financial stability and to help you to plan and reach your financial goals. Because I know for sure when I left my job, so I left my job when I was 21 slash 22, and that's when I started Penny's Pounds. Mm -hmm. um, and I left it, uh, you could argue a good and a bad time. It was right when the pandemic started. So, you know, we were at home, but you know, it wasn't the it best It could go time. either way, yeah. It could go either way, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, but then s since then, after that, I, I picked up some different things where I'd work six months here, I'd do three months there, just because it gave me that stability and it gave me some income to actually be able to continue building what I was working on. Exactly. And obviously, like I said, for the last three and a half years, I have been full time on this, but that has been a gradual process to build myself up to this point. And I think I have a lot of friends who are content creators, creatives, who are going back to nine to five because they just physically can't sustain this, you know, this income that isn't stable yeah and i think there is no shaming it absolutely no not shame. it's very clever and it's, it's it's a smart thing to do um and also it takes the pressure off your creativity sometimes um you know i was talking with a stand-up comedian um and she also was telling me oh you know maybe I'll, I'll have to pick up my temp job i was like that's amazing um and so we were having this conversation that we're having and at the end she was like oh you know what some of the stories that i tell as a stand-up com comedian have to do with the clients that i have in my admin jobs it's like well there you go sometimes they even do feed one into the other and you know you learn transferable skills i'm all i'm all up for it i'm all for it as well mm -hmm. when it comes to Budgeting and saving. Yeah. Right? Another big thing when it comes to freelancers is we, you and I know how important it is to budget, right? And obviously to save, as you mentioned, it's very important. Yeah. But some people will say, well, I can't really create a budget because my income is just so varied that I can't sit down and say, for sure, I'm going to get paid this at the end of the month or I'm going to have this to save. So what would you say to someone who's having that challenge um, to perhaps overcome that? when actually creating those budgets and planning those savings? Yeah, well, I would recommend, so in terms of like physically setting up the budget, 
um, you always start with your expenses and then you, you move on to the income. If it's difficult for you to predict how much you're going to do, um, there's a couple of different ways to do that. So you can either go, go back like a few months and just average out the income that you made over the past few months and just put that as a, as a target income, let's call it. Um, or you can do what's very, very prudent, which is you just pick the lowest income from the past few months mm. and use that so that you know that if you are more, then great. That's all, all of that is extra. Um, so that's that's what I would usually recommend. And also, don't uh, forget to, um, when you budget, don't forget to take the tax out of the income. When you budget for your own personal expenses, make sure that you're accounting for um, what you estimate is the net income that you would have. Uh, so net of tax yeah um so that you're already accounting for that yeah amazing so basically whenever you get your income we're, we're making sure to factor in whatever taxes you might have to pay on that exactly. so obviously if you know if you're working freelance you're probably not paying that straight away like you would in a job you're but you have to need do that to save year, up for it but it is still worthwhile and very important because when that tax bill comes you want to make sure that you've got you that want the ready. cash yeah you <laughs> want the <laughs> cash ready as well especially yeah. if you're one of those who files like last minute you don't have a lot of time to save up for it so make sure that you put it aside i usually recommend that as soon as you get paid as a freelancer 20 percent of that just chuck it away just forget that it's yours don't even don't, don't even, even get attached to it don't even no nope. <laughs> just like <laughs> move it out and that's going to be your tax bill so if you save about 20 percent of um each invoice that you get paid for that should be enough at the end to pay your tax bill unless you have to pay a payment and account for the first time mm -hmm. um in that case you have to save a little bit more but in general that works out that's a good, really good tip. Now I want to touch on something that you mentioned a little bit earlier, mm -hmm. and that's on diversifying your income yes. because it's so important. And I think as the time goes on, more and more people are realizing how important it is to not just have one stream of income. Where we talk about nine to five, a lot of people are realizing I can't just get paid 12 times in a year. Mm -hmm. I need to have other means. Yeah. And then look on the flip side as a freelancer, you're like, I can't just do one thing. I can't just do coaching. I can't just do events. I need to do more things. So what would you say or what tips would you give to anyone when it comes to practically building out and figuring out how to di diversify their income? Yeah, I love this question so much because that's an exercise that I had to do myself. So I'm ready. <laughs> um, so there's one thing that you have to do before you launch into whatever offer you have. Um, it's like a, kind of like an internal audit where I would suggest you answer two questions. The first question is, what problem are you resolving? Be very specific in um, articulating exactly what kind of thing you're set out to do and how you do it and how you do it differently from other people, because that is going to be at the very core of whatever offers you're going to launch in the future. They're all going to span. They were going or they're all going to um, depart from this question. What is it that you're doing? What is it that you're resolving? Who are you talking to? And then the other question um, that you should answer is, what am I good at? And also, what do I need more training on? So what are your strengths? What can you do with your eyes closed? Um, and that's important because that's probably going to be the basis of the first few offers that you're going to be able to put out there. And then the things that you still need some training on or, or a little bit of knowledge on still is the thing that you're going to want to invest in as soon as you get a little bit of return. And then after you figure out these things, you just map out what your offers are. So you want to have a good mix between active income and passive income. So active income is a thing that you get in return normally for your time. So um, you, I design a commission for you and you pay me for that commission. I work three days for you. You pay me for those three days. So you, so you exchange your time for your income. And passive income is the income that you receive uh, while working disproportionately like, yeah, when you work much, much less than mm -hmm. the, the potential income that you have. So a good example is digital, the sale, the sale of digital products. Yes, that's a really big one right yeah. now. A lot of people creating digital assets to sell. Exactly, exactly. It, it's, a, it's a buttload of work to put it on. <laughs> <laughs> um, and of course, it depends on what, what kind of uh, product you're looking at. But it's usually a lot of work uh, on, on the upfront. But then once, it, uh, once it's out there, you just need to put it in front of people's noses. And the income potential is much, much higher than the time that you employ in it. So when you figure out your offer, um, you go back to that first question, what problem am I, am I resolving? You break it down in several smaller mini problems. And for each one of those, you say, okay, so that thing I can resolve with this offer, that thing I can do through consulting, that thing I'm gonna create an online course for. Mm -hmm. And you slowly start to devise um, the various different things that you can offer. Make sure that you calibrate it with how much capacity you have. So depending on how many hours you have in a week, you can dedicate a little bit of time 
maybe half a day on creating your online course and then another day on consulting. So make sure that the mix is a mix that will allow you to get to the income that you need, but also that you're able to um, work on consistently. When I first started really investing in my business, well, when I talked to you about my career before, I told you that I, um, you know, did, had a career in accounting. So I was employed full time up to very recently, up to 2022. And then on the side, freelancing, I was having these one on one sessions with creatively freelancers, helping them understand their self assessment, helping them budget for themselves and set up limited companies and stuff like that. But it wasn't really strategic. I was just being recommended here and there, but I wasn't really thinking deeply about what my offer was. And so I sat down and said, okay, so my goal in about uh, a year's time is to work two days a week employed. That was part of the plan. Very happy to be sticking to it. And then I want my active income to be the highest earning thing because mm -hmm. my time is precious. Course, yes. Um, and so if I need to give it to someone, uh, they need that. That's going to be my higher price point. And I'm going to be able to work one to two days a week um, uh, with maybe charities or companies that need my financial services. So that's one part of my offer. My mid-range price is um, online courses and financial education. So I actually just launched a course called Making Friends with Self-Assessment, where Amazing. I teach creative freelancers to submit their self-assessment. But not only that, I actually teach a bookkeeping method that they can stick to so that they can eliminate the stress from self-assessment um, and submit months in advance. So, and I have plenty more ideas of, of what's to come after that. And then my lower ticket offer are templates. So um, uh, I love Excel and I love a, a good spreadsheet. So I have set up a few um, budget templates that people can download. So that's more or less how I've diversified my offer so that not all of my eggs are in one basket. I think it's really good that you've got it high, medium and low yes. ticket because then you can, like I said, your time is very precious. So that should be the most. Yeah. And you've got things that still require some of your time because yes. it took time to actually create those courses. And they're and higher in value as well. There's exactly. a lot of stuff in it. Yep. So that's in the middle. And then things like you said, templates, like I said, it takes time to create it. And then mm -hmm. once it's created, you can sell it infinitely. It's there. Yeah. Right, it's there. It's created. So I think that really does give a bit of an insight to anyone who's looking to put together their own. I love that question that you said, those two questions. Yeah. To ask those questions, to really get yourself thinking. Because mm -hmm. I think sometimes you don't realize how many more ideas can come when you actually ask yourself those questions and really yeah. delve deeper. For sure. Things that you can think of. Absolutely. And it can serve also many purposes, not only for your offer, but if you're a content creator, those are blog posts or Instagram reels, or it's very helpful to think about what do people need and how can I help them? Yeah, absolutely. That's mainly, absolutely. Yeah. Now I want to ask you something about skills. Mm. So I've, like I said, I've been working for myself. I've been a freelancer for almost five years now. Yeah. And I started very young, so I had a lot to learn when I started. And now I'm at a point where I know I know quite a bit more. But I want to ask you, for someone who's starting off, they want to get self-employed or freelance, what would say what would you say are some of the key skills that someone needs to start working on? You mentioned there you've got your course when it comes to self-assessment. Mm -hmm. When I did my first self-assessment return, I absolutely botched it because I had no idea what I was doing. No one ever teaches you that. Nobody You're does. expected to just know what Figure it is it out. Yeah. and just send it in. And if you don't know, then you get someone to do it on your behalf. Yeah. But what would you say is some of the skills that a freelancer, self-employed person should aim to learn as, a, as, as like a basis to get them going when, yeah. when they're, they're working that way? Well, I would really start by saying that it's not really a skill, but it's more of a mindset shift that you need to adopt in the first place. Um, and especially, again, I speak to creators most of the time. And the hardest thing is not really about learning the new skills because mo most people are capable to do financial stuff. Um, but it's it's about the mind block around it. And there's this, um, I think everybody who didn't receive financial education has a hard time approaching finances in general. But I think artists and creatives in general, there's this narrative that says art is pure and money is evil. Mm. And so if you're good at money, it means that you can't be a good creative. Sometimes it's even cool to say, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm a mess. I'm a mess with a camp. Yeah. Well, leave, leave me be. I want to like paint all day. Yeah. Um, and so it's almost like they're sticking it to the man if they don't deal with finances. Arguably, there's one person that they're sticking it to and it's themselves yeah. if yeah. they don't engage. <laughs> um, so I, uh, I work a lot in just like separating that out. And of course, that's, that's just a narrative that people tell, them, tell themselves. Money is not good and it's not bad. It's a resource that we have, just like our time and 
our relationships and our intelligence. And by intelligence, I mean, you know, your talents, your ability to learn. Like all three of those, all those things are neither good or bad. They are what you make them to be. And so why wouldn't, want you, why wouldn't you want to um, grow them and, and really uh, uh, just approach them in a way that, that um, will enable you to find success? So um, first thing, just um, take the fear away. You know, why I always say to my clients, there's no like negative effect in becoming financially literate. There's no negative effect with engaging with your finances. Uh, it will only, only, only bring good things to you. So why don't we do it? Probably because we are a little bit scared of the story that the money tells us about ourselves. Mm -hmm. We don't, we might not want to learn uh, about that because we take it very personally. We, we're like, oh, I've overspent, I'm a bad person, mm -hmm. or I made that decision, I'm a bad person. Uh, it's not about that. It's about uh, identifying behaviors and just finding behaviors that are better. That's that's just that's it. it. That's it. So um, I would say allow yourself, give yourself permission to just approach it, take your fear, put it in a jar on your desk. You can always go back to it later and just sit down and say, okay, what did my income look like last month, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Ask yourself the important questions. Um, and in terms of skills, I would say it really, if you really boil down to it, it comes down to just being a little bit organized, just blocking your time in your calendar to sit down and categorize your transactions, um, block your time to just like do the slightly boring, uh, but still very, very important financial care that you mm -hmm. need to provide to your business. Um, most of it, it's going to be reconciliations and running a little bit of reports and saying, okay, so last month this went well, that thing went a little bit less well. Uh, what's my margin? Um, what makes me happy? That's important. Always yeah. tie it back to those values uh, that make you um, who you are as a, as a person. A little bit of organization is probably the, a good place to start and just like giving yourself permission to sit down and engage with the work. And of course, ask for help if you don't know where to start. Absolutely. I agree with you. I think especially when you say sitting down with yourself and your money, mm. I think one thing that I'm always a big advocate of, which I do myself, is have like money dates. Yes, you know? love right? that, you love that. Have a good money day. I love just sitting down my finances and I'm just saying, right, for the next hour, the next two hours, however long it takes me, this is all about my money. Yes. So I do it both for my personal finances and for business finances. So anything that needs doing, anything that I need to send to this person, I need to chase up that, that thing, that is my dedicated time to do it. Mm -hmm. And I think, like you said, sometimes it is gonna be mundane. Sometimes it is gonna be quite boring. Not everything can be fun in life. Something just needs to get done. But so is brushing your teeth. Right, it's not fun. <laughs> I, I don't know whoever sits there as well in the mirror. I never to it. Yeah, but I mean, <laughs> if you do, fine. But I mean, some things just have to get done. And that is one thing yeah. you just kind of have to do when it comes to your finances. But even like with money dates, I like to say to people, jazz it up however you want. You know, if you wanna have it over your favorite snacks, you wanna have your favorite drinks oh there. Oh my gosh, yes. Jazz it up however you want. Exactly, to exactly. Make it as fun as you want it. And in fact, one of the things that I suggest in my course is to do tax parties. So if Ooh. you have, so, so, or finance parties. So if you have also freelancer mates that, that you can work with, just like, Meet somewhere, either at your favorite cafe or someone's house. Everybody brings their own, their own snacks yes. and favorite drinks. Put on a nice playlist. Um, and, and let's just get our taxes done, baby. <laughs> just get yeah, the financial admin done. Yeah. And it's like one of those things, like once it's done, it feels amazing and you feel really in control and it's going to give you like a nice boost. And then after a while, it just becomes a habit. It just becomes exactly. um, something that you incorporate as part of your practice rather than this thing that sits far away. You're going to you know, kick it down the road until you, you cannot do it anymore. Completely. Absolutely. I love that. Oh, I love, I'm going to start throwing finance parties. My <laughs> yeah. friends are going to be sick of me. I'm going to be having finance parties every other month. I love it. <laughs> That's going to be me. You give me a great idea. Sorry, friends. Sorry. <laughs> sorry, guys. That's going on. I'm so sorry. But now just to round off all the amazing gems that you've given us, what would be your top three tips that you want to leave everyone with? when it comes to managing your money, when you've got variable income and just bossing it when it comes to being freelance? Yes. I mean, I always say to start with a budget. Um, there's plenty of resources out there on how to start a budget and also give yourself um, permission not to get it right the very first time. But it, it can be as simple as just like listing out all of your expenses and just starting small and then building up on that. But the budget is at the core of financial literacy because it's about... Um, you know, many people think that it's like a slap on the wrist, oh, stop spending. But actually, it's a, it's an internal check on whether your spending behaviors align with what's important to you. So that is a good um, place to start, just like 
build on a budget and start there. Uh, the second thing might be um, put your fear in a jar. <laughs> mm -hmm, I like that. I'm going to have that right there. Yeah, I mean, it, it's normal to fear it a little bit, especially like it's a change that you will make and it's something that perhaps you've never engaged with before. It's absolutely normal to feel a little bit nervous about it. Just leave it there for a while. It's there but you're still gonna um, you know, create that time in your diary and, and engage with the numbers. Um, and the third thing, uh, keep learning, keep yeah. learning, keep engaging with content that is gonna make your financial processes better and your financial awareness better. Uh, like your podcast, of course. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> and everything that you've got as well, which will all be listed in the description, by the way. So everything that Susan mentioned will all be there. Thank you. Um, yeah, keep, keep engaging with it. Keep normalizing this behavior. And eventually it's just going to become, become part of, of your practice and of, of, of your yeah, creative freelance job. Amazing. Thank you so, so much for coming on to the podcast. No, thank you for having me. For everyone listening and watching, where can they find you? So my uh, website is called idlemoneyblog.com. You can follow my courses and my resources there. And I'm Susie Italiano on Twitter. Oh, I love that. So Italiano. That's my actual surname. Really? <laughs> yeah. Oh, that is an incredible it's surname. It's a fantastic icebreaker. Yes. Italiano. Whoa, that's great. That's me. Thank you so much for coming to the podcast. And for everyone watching, thank you. We're back again next week with another episode. Bye, guys.